Hello everyone, welcome to Arcade Mind. Today is the official ninth video and unofficial sixth video in my series on early United States Imperial expansion. The subject of this video and the next several videos uh, are going to be the lives of the Native American nations uh, and how they were impacted by the United States during this period of early United States imperial expansion. The subject of this video in particular is going to be the Arakara, their influence on the fur trade, and the eventual Arakara War on the Great Plains. So right off the bat, I'm sure many of us in the United States, and as well as other nations, when we hear the phrase Great Plains, we think of this region you see here on these maps here, um, a several thousand mile long corridor of grassland and sparse forest uh, that goes through states, including but not limited to Texas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, and Colorado. Uh, and of course, this is not an incorrect way to look at this region. However, uh, in terms of the political boundaries, i.e. the boundaries of the, the United States uh, states that now lie within this area, uh, it's not the full picture. These states only took on their boundaries within the Great Plains after a long series of events and processes. So, in order to get a better look at the larger picture of how the Great Plains came to take on its current political borders, we need to go back a little bit further in time to get a look at the better look at the larger picture. Which leads us to the first section, the background to the Arakara War. Uh, specifically, uh, the Native American nations of the Great Plains and their culture. So, first off, we need to point out when was uh, when were the Great Plains and the Americas in general uh, first populated by human beings? Well, currently, the based off of the current archaeological and genetic evidence, uh, the Americas were first. Uh, settled by the ancestors of the Native Americans somewhere between 30,000 to 20,000 years ago, or 30 to 20,000 years before present, uh, as seen in this map. And this was, uh, this is also evidenced by things like um, the pre Clovis sites, like the uh, Friedkin site, as well as the Meadowcroft uh, and Paisley Cave site, and the uh, slightly more famous Clovis sites here. And this uh, settling of the Americas uh, happened in a variety of different ways. Uh, it happened initially, uh, at least based off of archaeological evidence uh, and uh, models of what the uh, environment and climate of North America was like around 30 years ago. Uh, settlement initially happened via boat whereas the ancestors of Native Americans would sail along the coastline, or at least what was the coastline of the Americas at the time when the sea levels were lower, um, where they would sail along what is known as the, quote, Kelp Highway, which was uh, a resource-abundant highway uh, where they would uh, harvest food sources such as kelp, seaweed, and, of course, fish and marine mammals. Then, after the initial settlement of the Americas by uh, ancestral uh, Paleo Indians or Native Americans uh, along the coast, uh, a second group of migrations would occur when an ice-free corridor opened up in Canada and Alaska that allowed for uh, more ancestors of the Native Americans to migrate across the Bering straight the Bering Land Bridge into North America and then eventually into South America. 
with the Great Plains actually being one of the first places to be settled by the ancestors of the Native Americans. Uh, after all, if we look at this map again, as you can see, uh, the people first uh, came along the west coast and then down through this area here, of course, having to migrate through the Great Plains here in the center before they could make it to the east coast. So it's not surprising that the Great Plains would be one of the first places that would be settled by the ancestors of the Native Americans. That would, and this would eventually lead to the cultural development and cultural cultural genesis of a variety of different American, Native American nations, such as the Crow and the Blackfeet and the Cree uh, and the uh, Hidatsa, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but while this was, uh, while the Great Plains was one of the first places settled by the ancestors of the Native Americans, this does not mean that uh, more migration and settle settlement events did not happen. In fact, a, another series of large migrations uh, by Native American nations, of uh, uh, specifically the Siouan and Kadoan speaking peoples, would go into the Great Plains somewhere around the 1500-ish CE, with the proto siouan speaking peoples, including uh, Native American nations or the ancestors of Native American nations, such as the Crow and the Hadatsa and the Mandan, of course, the various uh, Sioux ancestors, uh, the Dakota, the Lakota, etc., uh, as well as the uh, Omaha, the Osage, and the Quapaw. And you can see their migration routes of those that I just mentioned here, the Osage, Quapaw, uh, Ka, and Omaha, and this map here. And you can see the gradual migration of the Dakota and the Lakota into the Great Plains on this map here. And then there, here is the map showing the migration route, uh, route of the Mandan and the Hidatsa into South Dakota and North Dakota. Then we have the proto kadoan speaking peoples, which include the Arakara, the primary uh, the primary subjects of today's video, uh, but also the Pawnee uh, and the Wichita, and of course the Kado, with the Pawnee and the Arakara migrating again somewhere between 1500 CE, maybe as late as 1600 CE into the Great Plains, with the Pawnee stopping right around here, and the Arakara, or uh, the ancestors of the Arakara, migrating further north into, uh, again, South Dakota and North Dakota. And here is that migration route seen here. While these migration events were happening, and possibly because of uh, the, possibly the cause of these migration events uh, was the reintroduction, a reintroduction of horses into North America and the Great Plains. So horses were uh, officially, at least based off of our best archaeological evidence, reintroduced into North America by the Spanish Empire uh, somewhere around 1600 CE with uh, starting in uh, the American Southwest in what is now modern day uh, New Mexico, with horses eventually uh, getting loose and spreading throughout the Great Plains by 1700 CE, as seen in this here. And here are conquistadors who uh, riding their horses here. After this spread of the horse into the Great Plains, the Native American nations of the Great Plains, such as the Lakota and, of course, the Arakara, would quickly become skilled horse riding warriors. And I do want to state that, yes, I know this is a black and white photograph from the 1800s. However, there were no, uh, I did chose this picture because there were no good artistic uh, representations of Arakara warriors prior to the age of photography. Uh, also, because of the 
uh, reintroduction reintroduction of horses into North America. Uh, uh, greater amounts of camp goods and foods could be transported, uh, which would in turn support a higher population density. Uh, and you can see that in this picture here. Now the question therein lies, uh, what was, what types of villages uh, would go on to support the uh, this new these new horse cultures and these new this new uh, uh, growth in population. Well, uh, for starters, villages of Native American nations in the Great Plains took on a variety of different forms. The most well known types of villages would be those uh, villages of teepees that would be uh, inhabited and utilized by Native American nations such as the Cheyenne and the Lakota. Uh, but uh, uh, with these types of villages supporting a uh, much more nomadic life that oftentimes uh, was uh, facilitated and, and in some ways required by being an equestrian culture, uh, especially if you're needing to uh, go and uh, look for food sources and grazing areas for your horses. Uh, but that was by no means the only type of village that existed on the Great Plains. In fact, tribes such as the Arakara, the subjects of this video, uh, and their um, longtime uh, on and off again allies, the Mandan Nation, actually lived in permanent or semi-permanent villages uh, that utilized earth lodges, like you see in these pictures here. And of course, with that in mind, you might be asking, well, how did, you know, what types of food did these Native American nations and communities live off of? Like, how did they support the health, the overall health of these populations? Well, uh, for starters, uh, most, uh, in fact, probably all Native American nations of the Great Plains uh, hunted and utilized game animals uh, such as bison and elk for their meat. But they didn't just do that. They also had varying degrees of agriculture that they utilized, where they would uh, produce agriculture based off of plants such as wild rice, corn, and sunflowers. Now, we might be asking, well, Dan, you have talked a lot about the, you know, uh, a broad, you've taken a broad look at the society of various Native American nations on the Great Plains, but what about the Arakara Nation itself? What was its society like? Well, Arakara society uh, was very similar to, uh, but not necessarily completely the same to, uh, most Native American nations on the Great Plains and really in the continent overall. Uh, Arakara society was matrilineal uh, in, in nature, i.e. a traced kinship through the female line where a person was identified with their, with their mother's lineage and property is passed down from the mother's family. Um, at least that's what the evidence implies. There is, of course, some individuals uh, that state that that was not the case, uh, but there's not a lot of evidence to going against the idea that our car uh, society was matrilineal descent, especially considering the Arakara, uh, at least to my knowledge, if you're if anyone from the Arakara Nation are watching, please feel free to correct me, uh, are still uh, matrilineal nature in nature to this day. Um, our car society was also matrilocal, meaning that when a young couple married, they lived with the woman's family. Uh, furthermore, women were in charge of agriculture, meaning that they that women were the ones who planted and harvested crops, uh, and were also the ones who owned agricultural fields. And women would be the ones who would actually build and own the earth lodges in which the uh, members of the Arkhara Nation would live. Uh, 
And again, as a metro local society, the occupants of the RCAR lodges, lodges typically typically include, included the owners, sisters, and their families. However, it should also be noted that men were in charge of hunting, and men could also be part of voluntary societies uh, that consisted of only men that would enact raids and warfare and would also act as uh, essentially a police force within villages and would also care, uh, care for the poor within each village. Uh, and a man belonging to one of these autonomous Arkara villages could acquire a reputation within the tribe and ultimately acquire a leadership position in a specific village. Uh, now, again, this is really the only evidence that is brought forward to uh, discredit the idea that, uh, you know, quote, discredit the idea that uh, Arkara society was not a matrilineal society. However, this this really doesn't hold much water uh, because this is very similar that this uh, societal makeup, this this sort of um, you know the way division of labor and things like that is very similar to nations such as the uh, Haudenosaunee uh, Confederacy, as well as the Cherokee and the Muscogee Creek and Powhatan, etc. All of which were basically ex almost exactly like this model, uh, where women that were limbs would be traced from the mothers, and young women, uh, young couples would uh, live with the woman's family, but men were by and large in charge of the warriors and hunting. So, if those societies in the Eastern Woodlands that I just mentioned, like the Cherokee and the Palatins and the Haudenosaunee, were matrilineal, while uh, men were still the military leaders, it makes perfect sense that so too would the Arakara nation. Uh, and here is a uh, general map of the Arakara territory right around 1700 CE. As European uh, colonists, as European colonial powers began to spread throughout North America, Unsurprising to, I'm sure, anyone watching this video, uh, diseases such as smallpox would spread throughout North America and eventually would lead to multiple smallpox epidemics, reducing the Arkar population from an estimated 32,000 to roughly 6,000, and would also reduce the number of Arkar villages along the Missouri River from 32 to two villages. Which would greatly disrupt, which would greatly disrupt their social, the Arkara social structure, uh, sometime between 1779 and 1784 CE. And here is a depiction of a smallpox epidemic on the Great Plains here, uh, and here is that spread of smallpox throughout the Great Plains here. Now we're going to again take a look at the broader uh, culture of the Great Plains because uh, this section involves most, if not all, nations of the Great Plains, and that is the trading networks of the Great Plains. So the Great Plains, uh, the Na American Native American nations of the Great Plains had access to a very well-developed uh, and very complex uh, trade network that allowed for the dissemination um, and exchange of goods such as shells from the Pacific coast and obsidian from Yellowstone, uh, which would be traded uh, in return for things like copper from the Great Lakes and uh, shells from the Atlantic and Gulf Coast. Also, they would uh, trade these items, obsidian and Pacific Coast shells, in return for things like chert, as well as pipestone, uh, walking shells, and conch shells, and things like that. In fact, the Arakara uh, themselves would serve as middlemen for trade between the Native American nations of the Plains and European traders, such as the Hudson Bay Company, uh, which you can see in these maps here, where the Arakara would 
uh, receive trade goods uh, from Native American nations as far as the Shoshone here in Wyoming, as well as various Chinook uh, and other related Native American nations in Oregon and Washington. And once they receive those trade goods, the Arakara and their allies, the Mandan and the Datsa, would trade these goods to uh, the Hudson Bay Company and other European and American traders. Now, with all of this uh, in mind, you might be wondering, how did they keep records? Like, how did they keep records, for one thing, of, of like trading events? How did they keep records of, say, the smallpox epidemic? You know, what? why do we know that these things happen? Well, we know that these things happen because the Arakara and most, if not all, Native American nations uh, kept records uh, on buffalo hides using pictorial calendars known as winter counts. All right, you can see them here. And they have been found to be uh, quite accurate uh, when, it's, uh, when compared to archaeological and uh, textual evidence from European and American sources. Now, I'm sure the biggest push on everyone who's watching his mind is like, well, Dane, you are uh, making a video about a war between uh, Native American nations on the Great Plains, specifically the Arakara, and the United States. So what did the warriors of the Great Plains look like, and what types of weapons did they use? Well, for one thing, uh, uh, warriors of uh, Native American nations of the Great Plains were predominantly horse-born warriors, uh, meaning they were cavalry-based warriors who focused and specialized on hit-and-run attacks uh, and shock and awe attacks. Uh, but that being said, not, no, uh, war no two warriors from you know no two sets of warriors from Native American nations look the same. They each had their own distinctive uh each type of warrior from each Native American nation each had their own distinctive identifiers. For example, this over here is a Blackfoot warrior and this over here is a dog warrior uh dog soldier from the Cheyenne. Uh, again note they were both uh, ho uh, horse warriors, cavalry warriors, but they are wearing different types of clothing and different types of, say, war paint and things like that. That being said, Native American nations on the Great Plains used predominantly the same types of weapons. Uh, of course, they used spears of varying uh, sizes and designs. They used uh, weapons like pipe uh, like pipe tomahawks, uh, which were made out of uh, iron or steel, that of course came about after contact with Europeans and uh, the United States. They also used various war clubs, like the Gunstock War Club here, or this war club style that you see here. They of course used uh, knives, uh, you know, made out of church or various types of stone, and then eventually after contact with Europeans and uh, the United States, uh, steel, though it's important to note that many Native American nations, even prior to European contact and contact with the United States, did have metal knives, but they were made from copper, not steel. Um, refer to my video on uh, Native American metallurgy. Uh, of course, uh, and probably very unsurprisingly, uh, most Native American nations on the Great Plains that use bows and arrows, as seen in these here, and of course, after contact with European nations and the United States, uh, Native American nations such as the Arakara would begin to use, to varying degrees, gunpowder weapons such as muskets and eventually rifles like, say, the Winchester rifle. Uh, Native American nations also did actually have uh, varying degrees of armor, uh, such as these bone breastplates that you see here. And they used shields, 
uh, with all of these shields you see here actually being uh, shields from the Arakara Nation. Now that leads us uh, to our next uh, big section, first contacts with the United States. So the Native American nations of the Great Plains, such as the Arakara, would first encounter the United States in the Lewis and Clark expedition uh, that lasted from 1804 to 1806 CE. After this initial meeting with the Lewis and Clark expedition, uh, as well as during the continued Lewis and Clark expedition to the Pacific coast, uh, a peace delegation uh, from the Arkansas Nation would be sent to Washington, D.C. and would include Arakara chiefs uh, such as uh, Chief Anke Docharo uh, and Tu Ne. Uh, I, I do apologize for possibly mispronouncing those. Um, but during the stay, uh, Chief uh, Anke uh, Docharo would actually die uh, and would eventually lead the delegates uh, to blame the uh, the whites in Washington for their chief's death. Uh, and this in itself would be one of, not the only reason, but one of the main reasons that the Arakara would become notoriously hostile to white Americans for decades. And this delegation would happen in 1805 CE. Native American nations such as the Arakara would again encounter the United States uh, during the Astoria expedition that lasted from 1810 to 1812 CE uh, that I've already done a video about and will be in the iCard. I also already did a video on the Lewis and Clark expedition, which will also be in the iCard. The Arakara would also uh, be one of, uh, and other Native American nations would also begin to, during this time, to trade in varying degrees with European and American fur trading companies, such as the American Fur Company uh, and the Missouri Fur Company. With the American Fur Company being founded by John Jacob Astor in 1809 CE, and the Missouri Fur Company being founded by Manuel Lisa, John Pierre uh, Trudeau, and William Clark, uh, also in 1809 CP. And yes, that was William Clark from the Lewis and Clark expedition. By and large, the most sought after fur by the fur trade and by these companies, such as the Missouri and American Fur Company, would be the beaver pelt, which would be hunted extensively uh, during the early 1800s. But it wouldn't just be beaver pelts. Uh, other pelts that would be sought after by the American and Missouri fur companies would include uh, muskrat pelts uh, or river rat pelts, uh, wolf pelts, fox pelts, bear pelts, and raccoon pelts. And you can see that in these graphs here on the average uh, harvesting of these pelts by European and American companies, such as the Missouri and American Fur Company, and in these graphs here. Of course, unsurprisingly, at the same time this was happening, both uh, as a result of the Lewis and Clark expedition and as a result, uh, as well as the result of the Astoria expedition and as a result of the fur trade, uh, the U.S. military would also begin to expand into the Great Plains between in the time period between 1808 and 1820 CE. They would first start this by constructing several forts throughout the Great Plains, such as Fort Snelling, uh, which would be constructed in Minnesota, and Fort Atkinson, which would be constructed in Nebraska. Uh, and these would all be constructed between 1808 and 1819 CE. As a result of this, eventually, uh, during the War of 1812, several Native American nations from the Great Plains, such as the Dakota, who were led by Wamata the Charger, 
would help the British drive the U.S. out of Missouri territory. But despite that initial um, pushing out of the U.S. military by the Plains tribes and the British Empire in the War of 1812, the U.S. military would make a comeback uh, in, the 18, in 1819 and 1820 as a result of the Yellowstone expedition led by Colonel Henry Atkinson and, and Major Steve, uh, Stephen Perryman Long where they would encounter several Native American nations uh, along their expedition, including the Arakara and the Pawnee. Uh, then after that would come the uh, most impactful expedition, and really the main reason for what would eventually be the Arakara War, the William Henry Ashley expedition. So, William Henry Ashley uh, was a, quote, mountain man, a fur trapper, who would found the, uh, what is known as the Rocky Mountain Fur Company, upon which he and this company would embark on an expedition to directly acquire furs and pelts, thereby cutting out the Arakara in their role as middle. Um, he would do this, uh, he and his uh, expedition would do this somewhere between 1822 to 1823 CE. Uh, upon his uh, entrance into Arakara territory, uh, the Arakara would actually request Ashley to build a trading post on their territory so that they can have easy access to American and European manufactured goods as they resent how their longtime enemies, the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota, had such posts, but they, but they, the, the Arakara, did not. Not wishing to limit his operations by having to maintain a permanent base, Ashley would essentially lie uh, and promise the Arakara that he will have the goods they asked for shipped to them directly from St. Louis. However, as I just said, he lied, and he never made good on this promise, at least had not made good on this promise by 1823 CE, and he very probably never intended to. Which leads us to the meat of this, and the main focus of this video, the Arakar War itself. So, because of Ashley's uh, blatant refusal to uh, one, build a trading post in Arakar territory, and his, you know, obviously blank uh, refusal, if not, you know, covert <laughs> refusal uh, to actually ship goods to the Arakara, uh, growing resent resentment would grow between um, the Arakara and the Ashley expedition, uh, and would eventually result in Arakara warriors assaulting trappers who worked for Ashley uh, on the Missouri River, resulting in the death of 15 of Ashley's expedition. And here's a photograph of Arakara warriors here, and there is the uh, battle and ambush uh, that the Arakara committed against Ashley's expedition. As a result of this attack on uh, Ashley's expedition, the U.S. Army, uh, the United States would respond with a combined force of 230 soldiers from the 6th Infantry, seen here, and this is their type of uniforms that the U.S. military would have worn during the 1820s. Uh, the the uh, military response uh, against the Arakara also included 750 Dakota allies, uh, seen here as well as 50 trappers and other company employees that were all placed under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Henry Leavenworth, who promptly left with this allied military force on July of 1823 CE. Okay, so now we need to take a look at what the weapons of the U.S. military looked at at the time of the Arkara War. So, right off the bat, uh, unsurprisingly, the U.S. military at this point in time had access to 
various cannons of various different sizes and caliber, like you see here. Uh, each U.S. infantryman and cavalryman was equipped with some variation of a frontiersman knife, like you see here. Uh, pistol technology had actually been upgraded a little bit uh, as flintlock pistols were replaced with percussion cap pistols that had become standard in the U.S. military, as seen here. Uh, cavalrymen and uh, officers of the U.S. Army wielded sabers, uh, generally, they generally looked something like this. And at this point in time, flintlock muskets, uh, oftentimes actually breech-loaded, like you see on this example here with this little latch here, were utilized by uh, the U.S. military. And actually, breech-loading rifles uh, were beginning to become the standard because they were much easier and much quicker to load. Okay, so now that we've looked at the armament of the U.S. military at, during the 1820s, we, we can now move on to the Arakal War itself. So Leavenworth would arrive at the main Arakara village, where he would then commence an attack on the Arakara village using his Dakota cavalry. However, the Arakara were able to hold off the assault by the Dakota uh, which would then promptly lead Leavenworth to order an artillery bombardment. However, this would be largely effective because the shots would fall beyond the villages, uh, which in itself would lead Leavenworth to order the infantry to attack now instead of the Dakota. However, a very similar result happened. Uh, the U.S. infantry was it failed to break into the village uh, villages, but mainly it was the primary Arkara village. Uh, so, because of the failed assault on the village, uh, uh, on the village and really villages by the U.S. and Dakota soldiers and warriors, the U.S. Dakota expedition would then leave the battlefield, but not before capturing horses and loading up the horses with corn taken from the Arkara farm fields. Uh, and this battle would happen. Uh, on August 9th and August 10th of 1823 CE. After this, Leavenworth would go on to negotiate a peace treaty with the main Arkara village. Uh, <laughs> uh, but despite that, the Arkara would decide that it was in their best interest to leave their villages uh, because they feared that they could not uh, keep up under con continued concerted attacks by both the United States and the Dakota. You know, perhaps they could hold off for some time against one or the other, but this was a combined military force, and that's never a good thing, regardless of what nation you are and how skilled your warriors or soldiers are. However, despite this peace treaty and the vacation of the Arakara villages by the Arakara, uh, the main Arakara village would be burned behind uh, Leavenworth as he was marching back to his base of operations uh, by resentful Missouri Fur Company members, which was actually done against Leavenworth's orders. Uh, and was done much to the anger of Leavenworth himself. And these events would happen uh, between August 11th and August 15th of 1823 CE. Now we come to uh, our next section, the aftermath of the Arakara War. Well, for one thing, uh, the Arakara and the U.S. Army never engage in battle again. There's never, uh, there's not a single other war that happens between the Arakara and the U.S. Na and the U.S. Uh, nation, the United States, uh, with hostilities officially ending when the two nations sign a peace treaty in July 18th of 1825 CE. Uh, also, uh, the Arakara War would go on to be reported in some of the winter counts, you know, those records I talked about earlier in the video uh, of the Lakota, such as the so-called Cloud Shields winter count. 
However, despite the peace treaty between the Arakara Nation and the United States, the Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota would continue to attack the Arakara and would press the north from one village to another, with the Lakota eventually claiming the uh, 1823 CE battleground as Lakota territory, uh, upon which the Lakota would uh, receive formal treaty uh, recognition uh, on the former Arakara land in the Treaty of Fort Laramie in 1851 CE. And there are the uh, migration routes, uh, the flight, the routes of the Arakara flight after the Arakara War. Uh, and here is a map of the of the uh, Lakota lands uh, that were ceded to the Lakota during the Treaty of Fort Laramie in 1851 CE. Because of this, because of this continued uh, defeat at the hands of the combined forces of the Lakota, Dakota, and Nilkota, the Arkara would eventually decide to settle with the, their um, longtime on and off again allies, the Mandan and the Hidatsa, on the Fort Berthold Reservation in North Dakota. Uh, again, as a result of the Treaty of Fort Laramie in 1851, as seen in this map here. After this, uh, many Arakara, as well as uh, many members of the Crow Nation, would become scouts uh, for the U.S. military during the height of the, uh, of the various Sioux Wars, including the Great Sioux War. I do want to note, yes, I am well aware that Sioux is a... Uh, uh, imposed term onto the Lakota, Dakota, and Nilkota, uh, but unfortunately the official title for these conflicts is the Sioux Wars, so I do apologize to the members of the Lakota, Dakota, and Nilkota. Uh, as the first conflict between the United States and the Native Americans in the West, the Arkar War would go on to set the tone for future encounters between whites and other Native American nations. And, it's be, and this is largely because Leavenworth did not completely defeat the Arakara, as well as the fact that he was, for the most part, very lenient towards them. Uh, and this would lead this leniency to spark debates, uh, a so-called great debate between white Americans uh, who demanded subjugation of the Native Americans and uh, white Americans who advocated for peaceful cohabitation. Which you can see examples of that here. Here are the white Americans who wanted conquest and subjugation, uh, and here are the white Americans who, at least to some varying degrees, tried to uh, facilitate peaceful cohabitation. Though, of course, a lot of times it was done uh, in conjunction with cultural genocide and really outright genocide. All right, so that leads us to our last section the Arakara today. So, the Arakara, uh, despite the uh, cultural and, uh, you know, outright genocide uh, at the hands of the United States during the uh, imperial expansion of the United States and during the Native American Wars of, of the Great Plains, uh, the Arakara and their uh, fellow uh, allied tribes, the Hidatsa and the Mandan, continue to live on to this day in North Dakota as members of the three tribes nation of the Hidatsa, Mandan, and Arakara, as you can see here in this emblem here and this map here. And again, despite the cultural genocide uh, and literal genocide and the attempts, attempted destruction of their spiritual and cultural beliefs, the Hidatsa, Mandan, and Arakara uh, continue to keep their cultural beliefs alive to this day. All right, so that leads us to the end of our video on the Arakara War. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you uh, enjoyed learning about uh, this uh, maybe enjoyed is the wrong term. I hope you appreciate learning about this uh, lesser known conflict between uh, the United States and a Native American nation. 
Um, if you want to want me to cover any of the subjects I mentioned in this video and later videos, please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section and feel free to like, share, and subscribe. And I hope you all have a good day.